Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about the ways we've learned about the brain over time. This is going to be setting us up for learning about the brain and the parts and what we know today. Uh, however, we need to start from the beginning and uh, historically what have we thought uh, in the past and where have we come um, over time to get to where we are today. So uh, we're going to go ahead and start and with this first slide I want to just start you with a quote. If the human brain were so simple that we could understand it, we would be so simple that we couldn't. I think this is great uh, just for thinking about the brain and realizing how complex it is. I really think that in the future we'll look back and just realize there was so much we um, didn't know uh, today and so much uh, further that we could go in learning about the brain. Um, just a really complex organ. So on this next slide, uh, there's a video that I'm not going to play here, but it is something that you can go back and watch if you're interested in it, but I'll just tell you a little bit about what this video is. It's about the Human Brain Project, and it's being funded by the European, European Union, and they started in 2013, and they're going to go for 10 years working to create a computerized brain that operates like a human brain, but can be um, manipulated, it can uh, be given a disease, it can be um, worked on through surgery, it can um, show the effects of medication, but all on this computerized brain rather than uh, working and experimenting on a human brain. So uh, a neat project that is being done um, based in Switzerland is just a video about it, kind of an interesting way to start, but since this is a recording, um, I'm not going to play that video. But let's start with the beginning. Uh, in the past, there was this idea that maybe the mind was in the body, uh, and a lot of first ideas were somewhere in the heart, what was where the mind was. And the Greeks really came up with this idea that the mind was linked with the brain, uh, the organ um, underneath your skull. And so um, some of these people uh, were people like Hippocrates, who he believed um, emotions thoughts, um, your mental health were uh, a part of the mind which was in the brain. And so uh, this is where we get some of our first ideas about the brain and the mind and the thoughts being linked. And then uh, another historical belief that uh, moved us forward in a sense was from a man named Galen who was a physician, a Greek physician, and uh, this is no longer uh, a belief, but he he had this idea that we had humors, four humors, and those humors were black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. And these humors were chemicals in the in the body and in the brain. And whenever they um, were elevated, when one was too high or one was too low, it would affect um, our 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 personality, our temperament, our health, and uh, maybe it would it would affect our character, uh, would affect us, and those could be uh, modified through diet or activity. And so this idea kind of started us thinking about um, chemicals, started th us thinking about brain chemistry, even though uh, there is not black bile or yellow bile or phlegm in the, in the mind. Uh, just got us thinking uh, and moving forward towards ideas kind of like that. And this was widely accepted uh, for years and years. Um, even into the Middle Ages, people believed in these like levels of, of humors or fluids in the body and in the mind. Next, we're going to move towards another historical thought that came a little bit later. It was called phrenology. And phrenology, it's, you can break it up into phren, which means mind, and logos, meaning knowledge, or so knowledge of the mind. Uh, phrenology was the belief that there are little sections of the brain, and these sections are all over, and there were actually 27 different sections, and there were 27, believed to be 27 different organs in the brain. And so this came from a man named Franz Gall. And Franz Gall came up with this idea that you could uh, see and actually visually see these places in the brain by looking at the skull. 
and he he thought the skull kind of was like a cranial glove so you could kind of see into the mind by looking at the skull and so this was proven inaccurate over time we know that you can't look at a part on the skull and go ah oh, you are a little immoral or ha oh, your character's a little off by looking at parts of your skull we know that that is not true but phrenology was the belief that there were small sections all over the head that dealt with different areas of your character your personality and that on the skull you could actually see if there was any any you know dysfunction in your character by maybe if there's an indentation he would actually even take tape measures and measure different portions of your skull he would feel for those bumps, indentations, any irregularities, and that would be a sign that, you know, maybe your your self-esteem was low or you had, um, you know, um, poor character or something of that sort, and that would affect your personality. And so, uh, phrenology a pseudoscience today. Uh, and that brings me now to the two videos that you can see on the screen. The one at the bottom is one that I really like and I love showing it. Um, if I get ch a chance, I'll show it in class. But if not, you should check it out. It's, it's pretty funny. There's a um, two men who are comedians and they do something on America's Got Talent dealing with phrenology and it's pretty funny. All right, moving forward, Phineas Gage is a case study that we, we have um, used in psychology to help us see how we have come really far. So we went from um, these humors to phrenology to now we have this case study where this really unfortunate event happened, but it was really good for science in that it showed us that there are parts of the brain that have uh, really important functions and if damaged, that, that function is impaired. And so Phineas Gage showed us that. You can see he's in that picture, he's got that eye um, open and one eye closed and and I'll tell you about that in a minute. So Phineas Gage, he was 25 years old. He was a railroad foreman. He was the leader of a group of men who were laying railroad out um, while the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad was going across the United States and they were working on kind of, a, you know, blasting out and leveling out this rocky area and what they would do is they'd drill down into these rocks and they would put the explosives down into the rock and then they'd have to hammer a tamping iron down into that explosive. And so as he was hammering that tamping iron down, it, it exploded. It came up, it, it went through his um, cheek right under his zygomatic archway um, and up behind his eye and out his parietal bone. Went out, landed 300 yards out. He, you know, fell, convulsed, but you know, he, he, he was alive and so his workers picked him up and took him out and called for a physician and uh, it was a, a miracle. He lived. Uh, but what we found out was he wasn't the same. And so this was a really terrible accident. It happened on September 13th, 1848, which is interesting right now. It is September 13th, 2016, so uh, ironic. But the tamping iron shot through his frontal lobe. It was 13 and a half pounds. So pretty heavy uh, tamping iron. It was one inch and a quarter in diameter. And so it was a, a big metal rod that went through his um, his head. So what what was really astounding was before he was this gentleman, he was respectful, he was just this really upstanding person. And afterwards it was really strange. People said he was violent, aggressive, he was disrespectful, he acted out on his impulses, he was grossly profane, and people just thought, oh my gosh, who is this? This is no longer Gage. And uh, what was really important from, from this is, is people realized damage to the brain had direct results in personality. And so um, here we have the damage to the brain showed that his frontal lobe, which was this section of his brain, actually was cut off from the rest of his, his, his brain. And so we know now the frontal lobe is the decision-making part of your brain. And his decision-making part of the brain was cut off from the emotional center. And so his emotions were firing, you know, I'm hungry, I'm, I'm thirsty, I'm tired, I'm angry, whatever his emotions were, and his 
rational decision-making, planning, judging part of his brain wasn't able to say, hey, that's not a good idea. Hey, why don't you uh, change your tone? And so he was just acting on all of his impulses. And what we realized was that there are parts of very localized parts of the brain that have very specific function. And when there's damage, uh, there uh, will be dysfunction. And so that was a huge, huge point in psychology. And here's a video. It's a reenactment of, of what happened. Uh, and we aren't going to watch that here now, but you're always more than welcome to go back and watch it. Here's a diagram of Phineas Gage's, uh, of his head. Maybe. Oh, there we go. So you can see it. It's going through underneath his cheekbone, um, hitting it, it hit and, uh, hurt the orbital bone, went up out the parietal bone at the top of his skull, and damaged his optic nerve. And so that's why you saw his eye was um, closed in that, that picture there. His skull and his, the tamping iron are on display uh, at Harvard. There's a museum in the medical building, and so you can actually go and see those. His brain was not preserved, but his skull and the tamping iron were. And you can actually see replicas of his brain and the tamping iron in other places. If you go to St. Joe, there's a uh, psychiatric museum. It's called the Gore Psychiatric Museum, and they have um, a replica there where you can see that. All right. We... So... Phineas Gage was a great example of how um, damage to the brain taught us something about the brain. And this is another example where we are moving forward and learning parts of, uh, about the brain through other case studies. And here are two case studies um, from Broca and Wernicke. Paul Broca, he was a man who did surgery on uh, a person named Ton. And Ton, he, uh, he had... Uh, so he was losing control of his right side of his body, and so he went in. Uh, Paul Broca was going to do surgery on his left hemisphere. Your left hemisphere is controlling the right side of your body. So he went in to um, give the man surgery, and um, Ton ended up dying. And so after Ton died, they um, were looking into this the autopsy, and they noticed there was damage to the left frontal lobe. And, um, and I didn't mention this, but the reason his name was Ton was because Ton could only say Ton, 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 Ton. That was the only thing he could verbally say, and so they called him Ton. Um, he had originally gone in for the surgery of the right side, but when they were doing the uh, surgery on, or because of the right side, when they were doing the surgery on the left side of his brain, they found out he had um, damage to this area, and they started to realize that damage on the left side in a very specific place will affect speech. And they saw this happen with other people and Broca realized that there's this very specific area and you can see on your diagram on the screen it's that pink area that is specifically responsible for production of language, producing, uh, making the sounds, making it come out, producing the language. Carl Wernicke uh, he came up with uh, the understanding that there's a part of the brain that deals with language comprehension. And this is in the left temporal lobe. It's that purple spot there on your screen. And so these are really, really similar but easily confused. Uh, Broca is production of language, and Wernicke is comprehension of language. And it's easier to understand these when you see someone who has had damage to the area. So you'll see how the comprehension of the language is different from the production of the language. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and stop the video here, but I'm going to go on in the next part, in part two, and I'll show you two videos where you can see an example of someone who has Broca's aphasia, where it's damaged to the Broca's area, and they have difficulty producing language like Ton. And then another video where someone has aphasia in Wernicke's area, where the language does not make sense. It's incomprehensible. Uh, and so that'll be in part two.